Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Hello and welcome to Deeper, your daily Bible study. I am David Salazar and with me is Dr. Tim Ramsey and together we will study the book of Revelation. We are studying this week on uh, the gospel or the everlasting gospel rather. And today, Saturday, March 2, we're going to study together chapter 14 of Revelation. Now, before we start, we want to ask that we... Uh, uh, the, we ask the Holy Spirit to come with us and teach us the truth. So we're going to ask you to uh, accompany us in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day and for the opportunity we have to come together and worship you through the truth and through the study of your scriptures. We ask that you will send your Holy Spirit, that it may lead us and guide us into all truth. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Tim, today we definitely have uh, a perhaps a beautiful subject, which is the everlasting gospel of Christ. And I think Amen. that you will agree with me that it is the most uh, valuable message that we have today, the gospel. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. Yes. And today uh, we're going to see how Revelation is specifically dealing with our end time messages, how they actually are based or are... Um, our, our, our focus on the ever, everlasting gospel. And so we're going to study really briefly Revelation 14, and we're going to go through the first five verses. But again, we're going to see how they connect or how important it, it is to understand that this is a result of the ever, everlasting gospel. I will read, uh, and I will, uh, maybe perhaps, Tim, if you can read for me, chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Certainly. We'll start here in verse number 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Thank you, Tim. This is an amazing um, description of a group of people. And it's interesting to notice that this chapter starts with that. The assurance that throughout the end time, throughout the experience of persecution, and perhaps in the last final conflict over this uh, of the earth, over the earth, on uh, on behalf of those that belong to the Lord and those that are actually taking side with with Satan, uh, we see that Christ, God describes in Revelation fourteen that there will be a group of people. Now we did notice when we had study over a little bit before over what the 144,000 are, some of the characteristics they have. And so we're not going to dive too much into who they are necessarily, although we do have to realize that this is a group of people who have learned to be able to overcome. And as it says there, they have found God and they have found uh, themselves to be so perfect and pure that they are considered virgins. They have not accepted the the errors. They have gone through a time where they they have not you know they have not set themselves uh, in 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 error or mis- or have uh, uh, been connected with uh, false doctrine. And it is they that are also those that walk with Christ. They go through with the Lamb wherever He goes. This is already part of a description of what will happen with them in heaven. Uh, although it is important to understand that they start walking with the Lord and they follow the Lord even from this earth. And, and you know, he, they follow Him wherever He is. Uh, but at the end, of course, mentions that they are found without any, their mouth is found without any guile and they are found without any fault. So in other words, they have no longer any unconfessed sin. They have not any, uh, you know, hidden sin in their lives. They are found without fault 
before the throne of God. So they go through the time of, 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 of judgment. It's kind of like giving you the end result of the product uh, of those that have followed the three in those messages. And so That's right. it, is, it is important, you know, to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and David, I think the key is something that you said just a moment ago here, and that is that they are no longer, uh, uh, or they, they no longer have unconfessed sins. Uh, you know, as we read through the description here, it's easy to maybe even get discouraged and think, wow, these are like superhumans of some sort, or, you know, I could never have this kind of experience. But the Bible very clearly says that they are redeemed from among men. They're normal human beings that have grasped hold of the hand of Jesus, and he has worked in them this uh, incredible experience. And as he lives in them and through them and they walk with him uh, day by day, he gives them this victory over sin. So, you know, we, we shouldn't be discouraged and think there is no way that I could ever be part of this group or have this experience. Look at all the mistakes I've made, you know, all the weaknesses I've had, the uh, whatever. The Bible promise here is that Jesus uh, can forgive, he can cleanse, he is strong enough to do this. And, you know, David, uh, I took uh, music education in college. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they drill into you in education classes is don't just tell it, you have to show it, you have to illustrate. And that's what I see going on here in Revelation 14. Uh, first, God shows in the first five verses. He says, here's the show and tell. You know, it's, it's going to be possible. I promise there is a group of people. Here's what it looks like. And then when we launch in, starting with verse six, uh, with the messages themselves, that's the telling. You know, here's the message that will take people and bring them to this experience with Jesus. So no reason for discouragement here. Lots of reasons for uh, trust and faith in God and praising him for what he can do in our lives. Amen. Uh, now, Tim, you know, it seems, though, that today a message of, uh, especially, uh, sadly, I will say, among many, even of our own uh, people, the concepts of have having to overcome, uh, being able to be found, as it mentions here in the Word of God, without guile. I mean, it speaks of, of people who are called virgins because they are, uh, it's a, virginity is a symbol of physical and spiritual purity in the life and conduct. Uh, so these 144,000 who have the name of the Father, which is, of course, the character of God, they have uh, kept the commandments of God and they are spiritual virgins. They are victorious in every, over every impulse and thought, I mean, in, in, in every impure thought and in, impulse. So, uh, you know, this this concept, it is, it is clearly seen. And not only that, remember that it's also mentioned that he, they have no guile. Now, the word guile carries the meaning of ferment or fermentation. A person with guile in his mouth has a defiling influence on others. Now, in contrast, those that have no guile are pure. They have a purity of speech and a purity of, of a conduct that is closely related to the purity of heart, a pure life a pure language, free from deceit, gossip, filthy words, and crude jesting. I mean, this is examples or, or attributes of people who have learned or have, by the grace of God, overcome sin in their lives. That's why they can stand before the throne. But but like I was saying today, it almost seems that among even among our own uh, people, the concept of, of being able to have that victory over sin it, it's, it's not, is not embraced and sometimes is outright rejected. Uh, thinking that today we can, you know, we will never be able to achieve a uh, victory over sin. And so um, with that mindset, you know, it's almost saying we will continually sin until the very, very end. And um, <clears throat> I don't know well, so if that is your a take, you know, but that, of course, that's not what you believe. But, you know, have you feel that that is kind of the attack of, of, of today? It's really a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's so clear when you read through the Bible stories, uh, and at the moment, I'm thinking of Old Testament stories, such as when God leads the Israelites through the Jordan River. You have to have faith in the promise, and you have to exercise faith before the promise is realized. So God tells the Israelites, you know, you're going to walk through this raging, flooded river, and you're going to do it on dry ground. Well, when is that promise realized? Not until those priests put their first uh, step into the water 
they exercise faith, they move forward in faith in the promise, and then God works. And right. uh, it's a powerful lesson for us today when we're talking about promises like this and in claiming Christ's power to overcome sin. Uh, he absolutely has the power and he has the trustworthy character to do it in our lives. Uh, but it's not something where we can sit back on the couch and wait for it to somehow magically happen in our lives. He expects us, just like he did his people in the Old Testament, to claim that promise and then to move forward in faith. And as we do that, he works the miracle. Correct. Amen to that. Um, you know, now there has been a term that is used uh, by, uh, I mean, I guess both sides of this of the spectrum of, of PB, people that believe in within our church, the concept of overcoming sin, at least uh, having a group of people at the very end before Jesus comes that have uh, achieved that through the power of God. And it's called the uh, last generation theology. And, uh, you know, and I just mentioned this because it's a concept that it's been, uh, it was part of our, our heritage as Adventists. We uh, had for many, many, uh, you know, decades believed that, uh, not necessarily I will say that we believe in this idea of a uh, last generation theology that is, was presented or preached in that way. But that's what it has been now called. The fact that at the very end, before Christ comes, there would be uh, uh, people who will have perfection of, of you know, uh, uh, not perfection, I'm sorry, have victory over sin, have uh, achieved um, the power over, over sin in their lives. But the other side, uh, those that don't believe, have put a shadow or cast or have, you know, tried to use this uh, belief that we had to make it seem like we believe that, you know, somehow people are going to be completely perfect and without any, you know, uh, anything uh, that, you know, that can be considered vile or, 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 or wrong in their lives. And that's exactly not, not necessarily the case. You know, we do have understanding that our bodies are going to continue to be, you know, <laughs> in the flesh. We're going to have a nature. Exactly. Yeah. We're going to follow nature, you know. And, and we, uh, those that be, are at the last time, they will have... Um, you know, it's only through the power of Christ uh, in themselves. There is not such a thing of a perfection of them. You know, it's 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 as, as it's only through through Christ's righteousness in them that they can maintain that that uh, power or, or that victory over sin. But um, you know, it, it is sad, and I feel that is it's disappointing that today, you know, our 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 some of our you know members, uh, even leaders, have to, totally taken away. This, this Bible truth and principle that people, uh, you know, by the grace of God will overcome sin. And this is something that affects the psychic of, the, of, 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 our, of, our, of our church, in a sense, of our identity. You know, no, you no longer have to feel that you need to be part of that group. You no longer feel that you will need to overcome because if you believe that all you need to do is sort of confess and profess uh, a doctrine, and you don't really need to ask the Lord to give you victory over your sin, you end up becoming uh, complacent and uh, you will not have, you know, the power of the gospel in your life. And that is what today we see that over and over. I mean, it doesn't matter from, you know, what position the church you have, from, from pastors, from leaders, all the way to, you know, the very basic member. We see people giving in to sin to the point that they eventually uh, are full blown, you know, uh, in transgression, and they uh, are opposing, you know, uh, when one, you know, against the biblical, biblical truths of of the gospel, which is the power of God, you know, to to change us. I pray, as we are run of time, that you will continue to study and realize that God has a promise, and that the gospel is the solution to give us a victory over sin. May God bless you, and we'll talk tomorrow. And uh, again, thank you for your time. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.